All right, we are ready for our uh, next speaker, Dr. Christopher Velez. Uh, he's one of the gastroenterologists here at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he is one of our motility specialists, and he is going to be speaking about a very interesting topic that you briefly heard uh, just a moment ago, um, the role of endoflip uh, and how we use it in esophageal testing. All right, Dr. Velez. All right, thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm gonna be talking today about Endoflip or Endoluminal Functional Lumen Imaging Probe. It will be a presentation that is divided into different parts. So I'll discuss briefly what Endoflip is. I'll give you a hint with a surgical focus of what diseases can um, benefit from the use of the Endoflip device, as well as ha uh, highlight a couple of practical cases that intersected the GI world with the surgical world as well as some clinical pearls that will, um, in some respects, reflect and complement what Dr. Chan just discussed in terms of his discussion of high-resolution esophageal manometry. So what is Endoflip? Endoflip is a device that is a separate tower that is um, employed, employed in the endoscopy suite or in the operating room space with a very thin plastic sandwich bag consistency balloon it has no ability to dilate, but what it does is it offers different physiologic measures that in some respects are similar to esophageal manometry, but in other respects complement esophageal manometry. So within the balloon, there are different sensors that are capable of sensing a proprietary electrolyte solution from Medtronic, the company that makes Endoflip, that then is allows us to measure different esophageal parameters during an endoscopy. So the reason why some centers don't have endoflip, it is a newer technology. Manometry has been around for decades. Commercially, endoflip has only been around since 2009. But there is increasing use of the device in more and more environments. I think it's important to understand the role that endoflip has in the evaluation of different foregut complaints or disorders, but also recognize its limitations. Because if it's inappropriately applied, then it can cause adverse patient outcomes. So there are different sizes of the endoflip balloon, six centimeters to 16 centimeters, and they're paired impedance polymetry electrodes that are spaced given, a difference based on the balloon size that are spaced um, along the length of the catheter within this balloon. And it's defined, the balloon itself is defined as infinitely compliant. So you should in theory be able to distend it to any given volume, um, although we have set volumes during um, endoflip uh, device utilization. So there are, you heard Dr. Chan refer to specific parameters, things like integrated relaxation pressure and things like that. Endoflip also has different parameters that are the focus of the study. So the main reason we use Endoflip are to determine different parameters, such as the, sens the distensibility index, which is a measure of how distensible the lower esophageal sphincter is, or can also be applied in the pylorus when you're evaluating for per oral pyloroplasty, something I won't have a chance to get to given the uh, time constraints of the presentation. And it also looks at different parameters, including the esophageal body um, peristalsis. So what you see here is a endoflip that is done in a patient with normal esophageal uh, motor function, both at the lower esophageal sphincter and at the esophageal body. And what you see here is that in the bottom of the screen, you see periodic relaxations, denotate, um, annotate, um, which are denoted by dark blue areas that are the expected physiologic um, relaxation, relaxations of the lower esophageal sphincter, as well as these vertical stripes that are, if those of you that were listening to Dr. Chan's presentation should actually remind you of a high resolution manometry um, study. So these are, analogous to the peristaltic waves that you see during a high resolution esophageal manometry. And these are what we call repetitive antegrade contractions, which are a normal expected feature of esophageal body function on endoflip. So I won't go into too much detail about this because Dr. Chan just um, described this in great detail. The Chicago 4 classification is out and what we're using in the motility world to diagnose different esophageal body and lower esophageal sphincter disorders. Endoflip is a complementary device, and Dr. Chan referenced that you use Endoflip sometimes to clarify a diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction. That'll be similar to one of the cases I highlight today. So 
if you remember the slide I just showed you of normal end of flip um, topography, this is what an abnormal end of flip looks like in the setting of achalasia. So if you remembered from the prior slide, you have these nice long slanted um, repetitive anti-grade contractions that represent normal activity. Here, that pattern is um, disturbed. It's disturbed in that the contractions are shorter. It's also disturbed in that they're kind of flipped the opposite direction. And these are called repetitive retrograde contractions. These are always pathologic and usually are associated with a major disorder of esophageal motor function. In the prior slide, you saw periods in the lower esophageal sphincter of dark blue, suggesting that there is relaxation. Here, there is none. It's angry red at the bottom of the um, at the bottom bottom of the reading, suggesting that this is an LES that's not relaxing. These are all the criteria of um, that also would in the Chicago classification and manometry match up with achalasia. So, that's the very quick brief review of what Endoflip is as a device. I'd like to discuss now for the audience, what are the different um, applications of Endoflip in the management of different foregut disorders? It's, there's a whole wide range of disorders that are getting increasing, increasingly looked at with Endoflip. So I already mentioned that you can use Endoflip when you're examining for per, per oral pyloroplasty in the setting of gastroparesis. You can use it um, with eosinophilic esophagitis there's a companion um, technology called ESOFLIP, which actually is able to dilate, unlike endoflip. But that's a bit too much to bite off for a very short presentation. So I'm going to review two diseases that I use endoflip routinely for. One is achalasia and one is GERD. So like a lot of things in the esophageal motility world, Chicago is a beacon for us. And this is a study that comes out of the Pandolfino group looking at distensibility uh, measurements in endoflip. And one of the figures in this uh, paper really highlights what endoflip is able to do. So on the x-axis, you see intrabrag pressure. In theory, if you have a very normally compliant esophagus, you don't need as much pressure in order to get the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter to open up well. On the y-axis is the minimal cross-sectional area. So if you have a normally relaxing lower esophageal sphincter, a lower volume should be able to give you a good amount of distension and open the lower esophageal sphincter. So what we see here in the gray lines are the characteristics at different balloon volumes that the endoflip balloon is di uh, dilated to. We see different characteristics in the response in normal patients to uh, the distension of the balloon and the increase in the cross-sectional area as the balloon is inflated to different volumes. And what you see here, you start off low in the square, you get up higher to the triangle, and then you get up to this larger cross-sectional area in the gray circle. The dotted line all the way at the bottom is untreated achalasia. And what you're seeing here is the end of flip is able to tell you that you need a large volume in order to minimally open up the cross-sectional area. That suggests patho pathologic lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. And what happens in treatment of achalasia on endoflip, and you can see this in the operating room after you're doing a myotomy, either per oral or heller, is that <clears throat> in patients that have a good treatment response, you have a little bit of an improvement in that, in this dash line right above the lowest line in the cross-sectional area. But those with a good treatment response in the solid black line, they start approaching the normal physiology of a patient without achalasia. So not quite normal. You don't have complete uh, normalization of the LES um, uh, impaired LES relaxation, but you do and it get improvement, and that's the whole point of the myotomy procedure. So one, in some centers, what endoflip is used for is as a companion test during um, fundoplication. Always a bit of a debate, how tight do you make the wrap? If you make it too tight, you may have a patient, particularly if they have ineffective esophageal motility, they and a poor multiple rapid swallow response, they may have dysphagia postoperatively that extends beyond the expected dysphagia during the perioperative re recovery period. And what in this study, there were 17 patients with GERD that were managed in a standardized fashion and they underwent laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication and they used the endoflip to see how well or how tight the wrap was. And they used endoflip measurements at different stages of the surgical procedure. And what they were able to see is the majority of the time, the surgeons are, they were great surgeons in this group. They didn't need to adjust the, um, they didn't need to adjust the tightness of the wrap, but there was one patient 
it's a small it's a small study, but it highlights the importance of using endoflip um, or the possible importance of using endoflip in anti reflux procedures. There's one patient where they were able to see on endoflip objectively that the sensibility was impaired, the wrap was too tight, and they were able to in the operating room before the patient came back in months later complaining of dysphagia, they were able to adjust the wrap in that instance. So this is an example of how endoflip can be used in the surgical space to help tailor. Um, fund applications, which normally, at least in our center, are built around a bougie. This gives us a, a more physiologic way to make sure that the wrap isn't too tight. So I'm going to highlight a couple of cases because I think that is going to be what is of most interest to the audience. So case one, there was a patient 64, year, 64 years old that had dysphagia with an abnormal manometry but didn't meet strict criteria by Chicago classification. So this was a patient that was several years ago. So we were using Chicago 3 versus Chicago 4. Symptoms had started several years ago. Um, it started in Florida. They occurred once every few months and they were sporadic. Then they started occurring more frequently. They had an esophagram that was done that showed prompt passage of contrast after three dilations had been done. Um, but there also had been spasms and delays in contrast passage before the dilations had been done. So this was the manometry that we got from our colleague in a um, more local environment. And it was interpreted as a mixed motility disorder, which isn't really a, um, a classification that's accepted within the Chicago framework that was characterized by diffuse esophageal spasm and panesophageal pressurization with the majority of swallows. There was failed peristalsis in 80% of the swallows, but there was LES relaxation. So the initial interpretation was there isn't achalasia, there isn't EGG outflow obstruction, we can't do much with this, we'll just keep on dilating you with the pa which, to, which the patient wasn't really happy with. So we did end a flip here to characterize what was going on. We used the 16 centimeter balloon that gives us different, um, that gives us the ability to measure both esophageal body function as well as the lower esophageal sphincter function. On the left panel, you see some of those repetitive retrograde contractions. You see also a very angry red stripe, meaning that you're not getting any relaxation at the LES. And you see in the bottom a couple of a few sensors that are in the gastrocardia. And, and we saw on the end of flip that we had abnormal esophageal body parameters. We also, when we were inflating the balloon from 40 to 50 to 60 to 70, there's a very regimented um, balloon, inflation pro balloon inflation protocol for end of flip. You don't decide your own values. We saw the diameter was impaired at 60 and 70 mil, uh, milliliters. You would expect that to be at least 12. And the sensibility index is very low, 0.4. Less than two on end of flip is abnormal. Greater than three is almost always normal. Two to the distensibility indices between two and three, it depends on what the esophageal body characteristics were. So, and to reframe the context, this is someone that had on manometry abnormal body characteristics, including panesophageal pressurization, as well as a normal IRP. We felt though that the reason why the IRP was normal was because the normal e esophageal gastric junction was disturbed by the large bougie uh, dilations and that this patient still met criteria for type two achalasia, even though technically on Chicago classification, he didn't need it with the normal IRP, but our end of flip made it a slam dunk diagnosis. We proceeded to offer this patient a myotomy and he ended up doing better afterwards. Case two is something that I'm sure is the bane of the, the sur uh, surgeon's existence. It's post-operative fundoplication dysphagia in patients who are being treated for GERD. 58-year-old woman had a laparoscopic parasophageal hernia repair. The reason why it was diagnosed was as an evaluation during an evaluation for reflux and developed post-operative dysphagia, including dysphagia to solids, liquids, chronic cough, chest pressure, throat clearing, globus, upper abdominal pain. She came to see us because she wasn't sure if she needed a redo of her wrap. Barry mesophagram showed prompt contrast clearance. High resolution manometry was ordered, which showed a integrated relaxation pressure of 27.4. So by both Chicago 3 and Chicago 4, given the complaint to dysphagia, she may meet criteria for EGJ outflow obstruction. But remember, she also had prompt clearance of contrast to the Barry mesophagram. We resolved this uh, discrepant, we dissolved, resolved this clinical di uh, dilemma with endoflip. And what we saw in endoflip was when we used the different balloon inflation volumes, the diameter was above 12, it was 15 at the 60 milliliter volume, and the distensibility index was 3.5.
So what we did was we reassured the patient and said, your wrap isn't too tight. You shouldn't get a wrap redo. What you probably have is some sensory dysfunction after um, having potential um, enteric nervous system compromise after having had a parasophageal hernia as well as a surgical repair itself. We gave neuromodulation or a little bit of gabapentin to treat that um, enteric nervous system neuropathy and her symptoms improved significantly without the need to do a redo surgery. And that was the end of flip that helped confirm that for us. So in terms of clinical pearls, what we say for end of flip, end of flip is a complementary device right now. It's not meant to replace esophageal manometry, although it may be in the coming years to decades that we are able to clarify major absence or presence of major pathology and that may spare some people manometry. Um, it is meant to look at both the esophagogastric junction as well as, and, as well as the pylorus and in the esophagus to look at the esophageal body um, in order to see what abnormalities exist in that portion of motor function. There, will, there should be a systematic use of endoflip. Sometimes I see uh, local providers just offering everyone an endoflip, which can often lead to some diagnostic ambiguity. We really don't, some studies have looked at endoflip, using endoflip to look at a diagnosis of GERD because you would have an excessively compliant EGJ, but we don't re recommend endoflip purely for the assessment of GERD. Um, and endoflip, I didn't really mention this in the talk, but as a clinical pearl, we don't diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis with endoflip, but it may have a role in terms of disease monitoring and um, assessing the severity of illness. And that is it. Thank you.